Chapter One of The Thing from the Lake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter One. As well give up the Bible at once as our belief in apparitions. Wesley. The house cried out to me for help. In the after-knowledge I now possess of what was to happen there, that impression is not more clearly definite than it was at my first sight of the place. Let me at once set down that this is not the story of a haunted house. It is, or was, a beleaguered house, strangely besieged as was Prague in the old legend when a midnight army of specters unfurled pale banners and encamped around the city walls. Of course, I did not know all this, the day that my real estate agent brought me his little car to a stop before the dilapidated farm. I believed the house only appealed to be lived in, for deliverance from the destroying work of neglect and time. A spring rain was whispering down from a gray sky, dripping from broken gutters and eaves with a patter like timid footsteps hurrying by, yet even in the storm the house did not look dreary. "'There, Mr. Locke, is a bargain,' the agent called back to me, where I sat in my car. "'Finest bit in Connecticut for a city man's summer home. Woodland, farmland, lake, and a house that only needs a few repairs to be up to date. Look at that double row of maples, sir. Shade all summer. Fine old orchard, too, with a trifle of attention. I nodded, surveying the house with an eagerness of interest that surprised myself. A box-like, fairly large structure of commonplace New England ugliness, it coaxed my liking as had no other place I had ever seen. It wooed me like a determined woman and as one would long to clothe beautifully a beloved woman, I looked at the house and foresaw what an architect could do for it, how creamy stucco, broad white porches, and a gay scarlet roof would transform it. "'Come inside,' my agent urged, hope in his voice as he observed my face. "'Let me show you the interior. I brought the keys along.' "'Of course the rooms may seem a bit musty,' No one has lived in it for some time. It's the old Mitchell property, been in the family for a couple of hundred years. Last Mitchell is dead now, and it's being sold for the benefit of some religious institute the old gentleman left it to. Trifle wet to walk over the land today. But I've a plan and measurements in my portfolio. I said that we would go in. If he had but known the fact, the place was already sold to me before I left my car, before I entered the house, before I had seen the hundred-odd acres that make up the estate. There was a narrow, flagged path to the veranda, where the planking moved and creaked under our weight while my companion unlocked the front door. Rather astonishingly, the air of the long-closed place was neither musty nor damp when we stepped in. Instead, there was a faint resinous odor, very pleasant and clean, perhaps from the cedar of which the woodwork largely consisted. The house was partially furnished, not, of course, with much what I would care to retain, but a few good antiques stood out among their commonplace associates. A large bedroom on the north side, which I appointed as my own at first sight, held an old rosewood set including a four-posted, pineapple-carved bed. I threw open the shutters in this room and looked out. I received the first jar to my satisfaction. On this side of the place, the grounds ran down a slight slope for perhaps half a block to the five-acre hollow of shallow water and lush growth which the agent called a lake. From it flowed a considerable creek, 
winding behind the house and away on its journey to the sound. For that underwater marsh I felt a shock of violent dislike. "'You don't care for the lake?' my companion deprecated at my elbow. "'Fine trout in that stream, though. I'd like you to see it in the sunshine.' "'I should care more for it if it was a lake, not a swamp,' I answered. "'Oh, but that is only because the old dam is down,' he exclaimed eagerly. "'That lets all the water out, you see. Why, if the dam were put back, you'd have as pretty a lake for a canoe as there is in the state. Its natural depth is four or five feet all over, and about eight or ten where the stream flows through to the dam. Even yet, a few wild ducks stop there spring and fall, and when I was a boy I've seen heron. Put back the dam, Mr. Locke, and I'll guarantee you'll never say swamp again. We will try it, I said. Now let us find a lawyer and see how quickly I can be put in possession. We drove back to the little town from which we had that morning started out, and where my agent lived, my sleek car following his small one with somewhat the effect of a long-limbed panther striding behind an agitated mouse. It appeared that the sale was simply consummated. I do not mean that all the formalities were completed in a day, but by nightfall I could feel myself the owner of the place. Perhaps it was the giddiness of being a landowner for the first time, or perhaps it was the abject wretchedness of the only hotel in town that inspired the whim which seized me during my solitary dinner. I had spent one night here, and did not welcome the prospect of a second. A return to New York was not practicable, because I had arranged to meet several contractors and an architect at the farm next morning to discuss the alterations I wanted made. Why not drive out to my new house this evening, and sleep tonight in the rosewood-furnished bedroom? The idea gained favor as I contemplated it. I could go over the house tonight and sketch more clearly what I wanted done, while I would be on the ground when my men arrived next morning. There was an allure of camping out about it, too. In the end, I went, of course. It was dark when I stabled my roadster in the barn that was part of my new possessions, where the car seemed to glitter disdain of the hay-littered, ragged shelter. Equipped with a flashlight, suitcase, and bundle, I followed a faint path that wound its way to the house through wet blackberry vines whose thorns had outlived the winter. My steps broke the blank silence that brooded over the place. At this season there was no insect life, nor any other stirring thing within hearing or sight. But just as I stepped upon the veranda, I heard a vague sound from the lake that lay a few hundred feet to the north. There was no wind, yet the water had seemed to move with a sound like the smacking of soft, glutinous lips. Or as if some soft body drew itself from a bed of clinging mud. I wondered idly if the tide could run this far back from Long Island Sound. The house reiterated the impression of welcoming me. I shut and locked the old door behind me, and went up to the room I had chosen as my own. There I unshuttered and opened the windows, lighted one of the candles I had brought, and set it on a little bookcase filled with dingy volumes, and threw my blankets on the bed. I had moved in. My pleasant sense of proprietorship continued to grow. Before I thought of sleep, I had been through the house several times from cellar to attic and accumulated a list of things to be done. Back in my room, an hour passed in revising the list by candlelight. Near ten o'clock, I rolled myself in a dressing gown and my blankets, spread an automobile robe over the four-posted bed, and fell asleep. End of chapter 1 Recording by Roger Moline